Johan Christian Meyer from the Norwegian Embassy of Niger and Chad will talk about migration and displacement after the Arab Spring. Maya works in the Foreign Service, currently stationed at the Norwegian Embassy in Bamoko. From 2008 to 2015, he was responsible for refugee issues in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He will talk about migration issues based on his experiences from that time, but also draw on experiences from Afghanistan and the Sahel. Welcome, Johan. Thank you. Um, let me say that I am in Norway now. By uh, by, I'm on on, uh, on leave, but I'm basically uh, working at the Norwegian uh, embassy in Bamako, Mali, and covering Niger and Chad from there. Um, the big narrative, looking from a migration and displacement lens, um, talking about the Arab Spring, will be basically that of the implosion in Libya and the explosion in Syria and how that affected um, migration streams that were actually there in the first place. I mean, there, there had been um, uh, huge refugee flows before the Arab Spring and there the still are, but um, the Arab Spring affected the, the sort of the dynamic of, it, of this um, and it did that in various phases, where you you will always have two factors. You will have the push factor and you will have the pull factor, and and how they played out in reality is is what I want to say something about. Let me just say that when I talk about migration and displacement here, there is a continuum. Uh, people are moving for very different reasons and. Normally, we talk about migration as being voluntarily and displacement as being forced. So, forced displacement or forced migration. And um, in these migration flows, we have, you know, a mix, mixture of a lot of people with different status. I've chosen this picture um, to start with um, because it's, uh, it's like iconic. It's the image we have of the migration flow in, I think, 2014. That's when it all started to take on huge dimensions. I mean, you had you had this um, uh, um, uh, people crossing the uh, oceans even before that, and it started out uh, actually uh, from Africa to Spain in the early 2000s. But then, it, when when the Arab Spring hit us, it it started to get very serious, and it. Um, it started to also, uh, there was huge arrivals and at Lampedusa. So this is my first picture, just to remind us what we're talking about. Uh, if I may have the next uh, slide, please. This is also a sort of uh, dangerous territory, uh, namely this, the desert, the Sahara. And um, many of the people who, after the, uh, the Arab Spring, came to try to, tr to cross the Mediterranean and enter Europe, actually first had to cross the Sahara, which is also very dangerous. And uh, this picture, by the way, it's, uh, it's a picture taken from the, the book uh, written by Fabrizio, uh, Fabrizio Gatti uh, called Bilal, which is a story he tells when he travels from Senegal to Mali, Niger, uh, Libya trying to to come to Europe as a sort of an undercover journalist, uh, the Gunter Waldorf, you may say, of that time. And he tells a story, um, and it happens in 2007. And this came as a surprise to me when I read it, because I thought this was, you know, more recent. But it just shows that this has been going on for a long time. Next slide, please. This is um, something very typical. It's a uh, refugee camp in uh, Kenya and uh, it's sh in a way it's sh it sort of confirms our beliefs about refugees that they're all living in camps but it's it is a more or less I mean a lie in most refugees do actually they are not recognized as as people living in camps they are surviving in, in urban slums and 
and their lives, it's very difficult to differentiate them. And, and uh, this is the point I also want to, ho I hope to, to stay with you, that these people, um, they are people, but they have very different status um, according to, uh, you know, uh, where they are in, uh, in a, a migration trajectory. Trajectory, and I want to um, illustrate this by by the next slide, please, which is uh, a map of Africa, and this is a map showing what happened to the people who lived in Libya uh, when the Gaddafi regime fell, and this was in 2011, as you may recall, uh, just after Tunisia, and what happened then. Uh, Libya was a destination country, a, a country attracting a huge number of people who's, who sought try work. They were regular migrants and irregular migrants. But when, the, when you had the implosion in Libya, uh, there was a need to evacuate these people. And quite, I should, I should say, quite successfully, uh, the International Organization for Migration and the UNHCR the refugee agency, they cooperated to evacuate people. And where did they go? If you see the dark countries there, these are the countries where, the, where they, you have most people being evacuated. And they are they actually had to go all many had to go all the way to Bangladesh. Many had to go to Egypt. You can see Chad there. You can see Mali, Morocco. So this was the, the first sort of uh, after the Arab Spring, the first people movement that happened and then um, of course in uh, of just after uh, the events in Tunisia there were quite a few Tunisians mainly young men single men uh, going to Lampedusa and this this also um, uh, was a, a pattern that was then repeated later now comes Syria and Syria was uh, as I said the big explosion um, started gradually and uh, what you had uh, is what you see in in many uh, countries that you start with people being in turn uh, displaced internally um, but after a while they um, decided to go where they could go so to seek uh, uh, protection they went to Lebanon they went to Jordan they went to Turkey and uh, uh, by then, there was a reluctance in Norway and Europe and in many countries to do something because, well, we were not sort of rigged for uh, a mass intervention. We tried, um, as we always will try to do, to solve issues where they are, where they happen, and hope for the best. And those who, who took the burden of the, um, the migration by, by then or the displacement was the neighboring countries. Maybe I can have the next slide. Um, this is uh, to show that uh, the migration crisis, even though it is, um, it, it was uh, the huge numbers were Syrians. There were other um, people, um, sort of um, taking advantage of the what happened, with, especially with the within with the new routes that appeared, and and this, the, the traffic across the Mediterranean. And, and they, many of them came from Africa, and that's where I'm based now, so I, I could say a little bit more about that. But basically what I want to say is this picture, show, this slide show the, the routes. We talk normally of three routes, the, the western, which is, um, which is the one that was used by the early 2000, uh, the eastern, which has been used for a long time. Uh, mainly for uh, people who are uh, traveling from Somalia, from Eritrea, uh, also from DRC, uh, Sudan, and so forth. And the new route that really took uh, uh, a huge number of uh, migrants um, after the implosion of Libya is the, 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 the middle route uh, we going through Sahara, through Niger, which is basically a transit country and up to, to Libya. Maybe I can have the next slide. Now, this is uh, uh, after a while, uh, as you may recall, after that, there, there, there were huge problems in 
in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Turkey, and an increasing uh, sort of political pressure in these countries for the Europe to intervene, and also in the European countries themselves to address the issues which were massively humanitarian. There was a, a start, a slowly, as a start of acceptance of, you know, having refugees um, arriving in, in Europe as well. And, and this uh, map here shows the countries taking the main burden. Um, you can, you know, you don't, you, you, wonder, you don't see uh, Jordan and uh, Lebanon there. You see Turkey in black, and you see some of the Central European states, uh, to, uh, Germany and Sweden. Now, the reason why Sweden is, is in black is that this is a map that shows the percentage of refugees. Uh, per uh, capita in the countries, but I mean the the big country that took the huge amounts of refugees back then was, as you know, Germany, and was a result of um, Angela Merkel's Wirtschaftsfonds. Uh, and this is when the the pull factor <laughs> turns in. This is this is um, the f I should say. I believe I don't. I I cannot recall exactly when I said. I would assume that it. She said this in August or September 2015. This was a big turning point. And that's when the pull factor takes over the push factor. And that's when it opens up for all these other countries, uh, all the people um, in the uh, countries of difficulties, not only in Africa, as I talked about, the Middle East, but also in Afghanistan. And I was in Afghanistan by, by then. And I saw how this affected the community uh, in, my, the, in that country in that fall. People actually leaving university, people leaving you know, well-paid jobs to go to Europe because all of a sudden there was uh, an opening, there was an opportunity that wasn't there. So people base their um, choices on opportunities and all of a sudden there was this, this, uh, this what I call the pull factor. In Norway back then, you may recall that we had a big discussion politically whether we should take um, uh, refugees as re resettled refugees, yen pusset things flüchtling as we say, and uh, five uh, political parties voted in favor of 10,000 of Syrian refugees uh, um, being accepted as, as quota refugees back then, and this has also been presented as a pull factor. I don't know if that is the case, but there was a very good communication among <laughs> among the smugglers and among the among the, uh, the uh, mainly young male population where to go and when to go and how to go and that did affect the uh, the big uh, sort of migration uh, uh, pattern as well um, maybe we could go a little further on this slide next slide uh, showing this might not be a very good slide, but I want, just want to show uh, the the one on the the right side there. Uh, the picture, the the figures for 2014 shows, you know, the the number of refugees per capita in individual countries, and the one that took the most refugees per capita back then was Hungary, and uh, I thought that was uh, quite a revealing because. Um, as you know, the events in, in Hungary since, uh, and maybe already back then, hasn't been very positive for refugees. And, and this affected uh, Hungary also politically. And this is a point, I, I, I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on this afterwards, but I think the point is important that the refugee uh, influx in Europe did affect us politically uh, in many countries. Uh, I. I uh, would make the point that, that we probably wouldn't have seen Brexit if this hadn't happened, and we wouldn't have seen the, the turn uh, of politics uh, to, to right-wing politics in Eastern Europe to the same extent as we did if it hadn't been for the uh, migration. Now, um, next, pay, next slide, please. This is uh, to show, this is also very complicated, but I just want to show <laughs> To let you know that, you know, um, on the on the left hand side you have the countries of origin. On the right hand side you have the countries of destination. And even though we present this as a European problem, it basically is 
not a European problem because most people who fled Syria and Afghanistan, which are the two big countries of origin, they ended up not in Europe, they ended up in other countries like, as I already said, uh, in the Middle East of, of the, the Syrian refugees, but the Afghanis, for example, ended up in Pakistan and Iran. And um, if you look at that list on the right hand side, there is not one single European country, they are all classified as others and there are still quite a few few numbers. But even those that, those few numbers did have a huge effect in Europe. Um, yeah, next uh, slide, please. This is uh, just to show a little bit the situation in Norway, um, and uh, I thought that it's interesting to see that there is a not immediate effect of the Arab Spring on refugee on on a refugee asylum seekers uh, applying for asylum in in Norway. It comes in 2014, and it's. The big the the big figures are from Syrians, and the next next one is from uh, uh, Afghanistan. Next, please. This is um, also to bring things in perspective. This is actually showing uh, the number of uh, people um, migrating to Norway being refugees in comparison with the others, and the others are. People who search, uh, search for uh, ordinary, uh, you know, workers, migrant workers, and family reunifications, and the refugees is the third largest group, even in 2015. So it brings things into into perspective. Next, please. Now I, I took this, you know, picture of this book by Samuel Hunting to talk about some root causes. Um, you know, turning back to the push factors, we talk about uh, conflict and uh, human rights violations as one of the drivers of uh, migration. I think that applies. I mean, it definitely applies to Syria. There's no doubt about it. I mean, they were all war refugees and they qualified as, as asylum seekers simply because they could not be returned. It would be unsafe. They did, did not need an individual asylum application uh, determination. They were classified as, as um, uh, refugees as such. But um, if you again look at the big picture, why people are, are, uh, are fleeing, uh, are moving. It's it's not always about conflict and and uh, and human rights violations. So maybe I can have the next uh, slide. And to return to where I come from, Sahel. This is a picture from Niger, just north of Niamey. It shows um, the you know the the territory they live in. People um, striving with uh, desertification. This is uh, a huge uh, a problem. The number of people living off, you know, farming and herding in the Sahel it's it's basically like 80 percent, and it's a number that is growing all the time, partly because of enormous population growth, and also affected by climate change. And this is not sustainable. People are living on less and less earth and striving to make an outcome and, uh, and poverty is increasing and uh, there are lots of health issues and other issues. In addition, uh, there is the uh, importation of Islam, returning to the issue that was raised by Lars Kule. Uh, Islam, I mean, Islam has always been there, but in Sahel it came with, uh, after the uh, in, after the fall of Gaddafi was increase of violent and sectarian extremism and uh, and to the, together with that came Islam as a factor intervening with local conflicts. Talk, uh, uh, Morten Burles talked about this yesterday about you know the ethnic conflicts that were already there and they are being um, used by the Islamist organizations to create alliances and to get a foothold on these countries. So uh, this is not all about natural disasters and poverty and desertification. It's about conflict being induced by the resource um, uh, 
the the uh, the conflict of resources and especially uh, between the farmers and the herders. This is a huge issue and has always been in Africa, but they have always solved the issue by negotiating and by having their traditional leaders meet and so forth. But it's been compounded by the fact, I think I should mention three factors, population growth, climate change, and and these Islamist groups. So by now it's 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 getting worse and and worse. So this is just to show that the push factors are many, and they are still with us. And even though the Arab Spring has come to an end, we may say, uh, the problems are not over by no means. Um, so if I may say a little bit more about you know. And I don't know how much time I have left now. Five minutes, okay. Um, push and pull. These are the you know the the big the big explanations. But of course, if you want to explain how pe these particular people end up exactly there, and when and how and who they are, I think it's fair to say that uh, there are many many factors uh, deciding that. And one of the main ish main probably and Paul Collier which is a research of famous research has made this book at this point in the book called Exodus that the only way you can control migration is by migration uh, by immigration uh, control uh, so that it's not possible actually to stop migration by fighting poverty in the countries of origin because if people have more um, resources, they will also be more likely to to leave their countries of origin. Um, and and the, the, I think this point is to say that those who leave are not the poorest. It's not the trapped populations who leave. It's those who have some resources, some family connections, some money also some connections to the diaspora in the countries of of destination who has the contact contact to the networks who have are able to pay the smugglers these are mainly uh, had always been i should say and still are young uh, male uh, um, uh, people with some um, professional skills um, and the most likely to succeed I saw this in Afghanistan uh, as, as well that, and I, as I mentioned, people leaving their paid jobs to do that. In Afghanistan, it's like become like a tradition. If you're a big family, you can actually make an investment in your sons. If you have like several, you can send one to Taliban, you can send one to Europe, and you can keep one at home. It's a it's a sort of safeguarding. Uh, it's a, it sounds a little cynical, but that is actually how people uh, make a survival in in the, in hard uh, times. I think I'll stop here and uh, maybe we can continue during the discussion. Thank you.